I come at this because I'm not only an archaeologist, sort of in between my break in archaeology, between my undergraduate and my postgraduate years, I was a teacher at primary school for nearly 10 years. Um, so I'm looking at this both from the perspective of an archaeology professional academic, but also as an educational professional in the mainstream um, pre-18 sector. Um, and the way I see it is that outreach in schools, it's not just a good way of getting kids to maybe want to be archaeologists one day, it's also a good way of spreading the message of high port and like, going back to that discussion just how, how relevant archaeology is to the general public and to people in their everyday lives. And it's sort of like, it's a way of gradually increasing public knowledge and public awareness of it in a way that's sort of, it's a soft way of doing it basically. Um, so is there a place for archaeology in schools? Um, I mean, obviously, we've had a lot of recent things with things like the A-level being scrapped, and there's so much pressure in schools. It's a very intense pressure, especially in the primary sector, for the key areas, obviously, like maths, sciences, English, to perform in those above everything else, league tables and SAT scores. They are prior to every school. You, know, you must perform in those. And you know, when it comes to things like history or art or other subjects, they kind of fall by the wayside. You know, it's a project you do for half a term on a Wednesday afternoon occasionally. You might go to visit a museum, increasingly difficult now they're closing the museums down. You might get somebody to come and visit the school who's working for the museum service, but it's very sporadic. But there's such an incredible skill set to be had. I've just chosen a really sort of like brief snapshot of the skills that archaeology can offer schools in there. You know, research skills, critical thinking, report writing, um, statistical analysis, you know, citizenship, looking at things like more political subjects and communication skills to a broad, wide subjects areas. Um, it can offer such great cross-curricular things that I think if we can communicate to schools that we can offer them something like that, it will become very valuable to them in secondary and in primary. Um, and also more politically speaking, um, and this is where the relevancy comes in, things like global citizenship, immigration, sustainability, resource management. I mean, history teaches us how we behaved in the past and how maybe we don't want to repeat the things we did in the past, you know. It gives us respect on what we're doing today by showing us what we did before and maybe how we can not emulate that, how we can move on as people and how we can give our action today context for what we've done in the past. I mean, obviously we've had the great quotes about, you know, history written by the victors and about if we don't learn from the past, we're doomed to repeat it. They're really common things that we all obviously know, but then school children don't. So <coughs> if we can give them that context, it can mean that they start to awaken politically, as it were, not just psychologically, but generally politically speaking. But how do we bring these messages to schools in sort of this post-truth world as we're talking about this this anti-expert world and i really don't like the term post-truth because i just like to call it what it is which is basically lies and bullshit um i like to just call a spade a spade in that respect um when you come across this kind of attitude well this is the twitter spat many of you might have seen it online um between mary beard and aaron banks who's a ukip donor and he was basically like yeah the roman empire was destroyed by immigrants and mary beard's like well hang on a minute you might want a quick fact check on that. And he was like, no, I'm adamant, I'm telling you. This is how it happened. And she was like, oh, maybe, maybe you should quickly fact check that again. And he's like, no, I've studied it extensively. You don't have the monopoly on history, he says to the Cambridge Don of ancient history. Um, <laughs> and basically, he later came on his conversation that his extensive teaching was basically his teaching at primary school. Um, and he... He thought that you know that made him the expert because you know, you know 20 25 years ago he learned that x happened in the roman empire and that he didn't have to listen to anything else at all because he might have been taught the basic of history but he wasn't taught how to critically analyze it he wasn't told how to look at sources he wasn't told how to look at it in different political perspectives so he's got a very blinkered sort of very traditional history teaching view of how the past has happened he hasn't been taught how to really look at history which is what I think archaeology can bring to schools. Um, unfortunately, we're up against this, this anti-expert opinion in the mainstream press so much because politicians, lovely Michael Gove again, um, thinking about, I think people have had enough of experts. And when he's, when he's saying that, he's not really talking about academics. I mean, people have brought up today that there's not just experts involved in archaeology, there's public archaeology, community archaeology. These people get lumped in with the experts. If you're involved in a field, even if you're not a professor, even if you're not a qualified academic, you get lumped in with these experts because you're working in it, you give opinions on it, you give facts on it. So as far as a press, the mainstream press is concerned, you are an expert, you are the anti that they don't want to have to resort to when they're looking at something. Basically, they only want their own opinions. They don't want anybody's opinions who's involved in this field. Um, and Michael Gove did try and backtrack on this, 
um, this thing and said, he said, oh, I was taken out of context. What I meant is the experts just need to know their place. I was like, yeah, good backtracking, excellent <laughs> skills there. So how do we sort of fight against this attitude is what I'm saying. And basically, um, you've got to get them young. <laughs> Because the hardest thing, and many people will know if they teach adults or um, old, you know, into <laughs> mature students, is the hardest thing is to change an opinion that is deeply ingrained. If, you know, if someone's got an opinion they've formed over many years of experience in life, it's incredibly hard to change that. You know, we, if we do outreach and you're saying like, we've got to appeal to like, you know, the core voters, older voters, it's going to be incredibly difficult to change their mind. They've lived their life, they've built their mindset. You know, they don't want to, and it takes an incredibly persuasive and incredibly hard work to do that. It's much easier to get in there when they're kids. They've still got open minds. They're still little sponges that want to learn. They can still learn these key skills of, you know, critical analysis, looking at things differently, really getting into the ideas of things rather than just being told rote learning, this is how history happened, you will accept this. They can learn these critical skills at a young age and start doing it. My son's probably going to end up being an archaeologist. I'm so sorry. He already digs up rubbish all the time, so he's getting there. Um, <clears throat> so our way in, basically, is through the national curriculum. Primary is probably much easier for us because the recent rewrites to the curriculum mean that they've got a, a pretty broad selection of historical periods that you know they are supposed to study. So there's some British history in there. There's a few areas of British history they got to cover, but there's also some worldwide things like the standard things like they can do Egypt, they can do a bit about the Roman Empire, they can do a bit about the Maya. I think there's a little bit about China in there as well. So there's gradually more in. So there's more scope for people who aren't just, you know, British prehistorians, who aren't just Roman experts to go into schools and be able to teach about their subject in a way that really gets young people. I mean, it is unfortunate now they're having these discussions about the archaeology A-level. And if anybody watched the debate in Parliament last week, you know that it was a pretty poor response by the government when called upon this, saying, look at this, these skills you're turning away, looking at these ways that you can engage people that you're getting rid of. The, the argument was basically, well, they can just volunteer if they want to get into archaeology, which completely ignores the idea that volunteering in archaeology is a, a way in for some, but for some it's financially completely out of reach. It happens away from their homes. They usually have to pay to go and dig there, even if they're on a volunteer basis. The archaeology able was kind of a, a more level playing field for it to happen for them. So going into schools, for us, it's a way of taking it to them, basically. You know, you can't take the horse to water, but we can take the water to them, is what I'm saying. Um, and I'd like to give an example that I use in primary schools. Uh, this is the story of the Amersbury Archer. So I do this in both primary and secondary, so obviously I change slightly what I do when I go in there. Uh, this is an illustration from a really nice book that's just come out by Jane Brain. She's doing a lot of interpretation panels for various historic monuments for English heritage, historic England now. Um, and the book is the Archer Journey to Stonehenge. And it's all about the archer coming from Europe in, into Stonehenge and like what happened to his life and what he brought with him and things. And what I try and get kids to do is sort of like understand his story and understand the political ramifications of it as well. Even in quite a young primary age, they get it. So I do things like, I like have a huge sheet with the skeleton on it and I'll say, well, what do you notice he's got with him? You know, before I give them any of the details, I try and make them use their observation skills. And then I'll sort of tell them, well, well, we can tell a lot of things about him by looking at his skeleton. I'll tell them a little bit about isotopes, vaguely what they mean, because, you know, the primary school kids aren't going to go into it if I go, and then when you do this option chart, it does this. They basically give them a few isotope charts, but give them the ones to the British Isles first and say, well, does it match any of these? Then I have a bit of a discussion, a bit of a talk about it. And they come back to you and say, no. And you say to them, well, here's the European charts. Where do you think he might have come from? And eventually, when they match it up, they have this realisation, he's grown up somewhere else. He's come in to the country. And that feeds into this huge discussion about why has he come here? You know, what has he brought with him? Looking back at the artefacts, you'll say, he's got gold in there. He's got some of the earliest metalwork. He's got different kinds of pottery. Yes, he's come into the British Isles. What ideas has he brought with him? What changes to society and culture could him and his relatives and his people have brought with him? that has meant that we've developed and grown as a culture. You know, it's, it's giving those ideas that, yes, you know, it, some might call it propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm trying to show them is that the narrative you are presented day to day in the mainstream press is not the only narrative that exists. Here are some sources. What do you think they are saying? You know, what, what do you think you can get from this? And you will get some kids who still will say, why has he come here? You know, this is a this is a terrible thing. But that sparks such an amazing discussion. Even with really young four or five year olds, they will get into it. And it is like watching little mini MPs having a shout at each other across <laughs> the divide of Parliament. It's fantastic. You know, you give kids just like a little bit of leeway to let their minds go, and they are really into it. You know, it's it's having that difference between teaching them about 
history and teaching them the skills to learn their own history. Thank you. Um, so, be, using a, a political tool in schools is one thing, but obviously there are other groups who use archaeology in similar ways for their other ends, for lack of a better term, for use it for bad. Um, the first picture there is the Palmyra Arch they put up in Trafalgar Square. Um, and I wouldn't say this was necessarily used for bad, I think it's probably just misguided as to where I would say you use it. Um, they recreated it, it's 3D printed, and they took it to various sort of locations, I think it was New York and somewhere in Dubai, I think. And they basically said, oh, you know, we're, we're recreating it and we're going to repatriate it back to Palmyra afterwards. I was like, how can you repatriate a 3D printed object that's not got actually any real connection to the original that you've traipsed around the world with no context and no information for people who are staring up at it? That's kind of a strange thing to do. So we've got to be aware that these narratives are used by other groups as well. And the second one is that some of the biblical archaeology, I can't remember the name of the chat, but basically he spent his entire life as an amateur archaeologist going into the N Middle East, Near East, and looking at things like and saying, this is Noah's Ark, this is the, you know, the house, this is like the house of Jacob kind of thing. Um, and it, what it is really about is making sure that messages that get out there uh, by the people that are working on it, that we're giving quality and relevant information to people so that this kind of thing can quite rightly be denounced. But the public can look at that and go, hang on, they're not doing this, they're not doing this, Why, you know, is this accurate? And somebody did mention Britain first earlier. <laughs> I read their website, so you don't have to. Um, but <laughs> this is a the narrative they're using to talk about um, ancient Britain. Basically, they say that since the last ice age to now, we're like genetically identical for that entire period. And they say, oh yeah, the Vikings, everyone came across and they gave us these right ideas, but they didn't breed with us or anything like that. It's this really strange genetic purity argument that they're going for. So again, it's this fact that archaeological information can be misrepresented so badly and have such a negative message that we as archaeologists, you know, we're the gatekeepers of this information as it were. You know, we, we create this knowledge. We need to disseminate it in a way that people can appreciate it, understand it, feel it's relevant to them. Um, and I say that it's not just a classroom you can do this. Um, a lot of like places like Glastonbury Festival um, and Festival, they have areas that are like uh, the science tent is a Glastonbury Festival particularly, and loads of outreach happens there because there are families as well as like adults go in there, and it's a great place to get a message of a demographic of people who wouldn't necessarily see your work otherwise. You know, it's getting out of that bubble. Um, I mean, things like the Social Science Festival, it is kind of preached to a convert a bit because they are people who are already engaged. But it's, it's all about just getting beyond your academic bubble and getting to people who wouldn't necessarily see what you were talking about before. <coughs> and I know that in practice, we're all money and time constrained, and this is like an extra layer of things to do. You know, getting out to a school, you know, you've got to take a half day, a day out of your classroom teaching, you know, but there are ways of doing it that means that it won't have as much an impact if you have to plan the whole thing out. Um, so most universities um, have outreach and public engagement unions. They can provide like trained students to help out with you. They can give you funding and um, they can give you lesson plans and ways to build into the curriculum, which lightens the load on you when you're planning these things, basically. And there are organisations specialising in outreach, like a Big Heritage who are based in Chester, do a fantastic range of stuff. They put on museum exhibits, they go to schools, they go to festivals, they go to the Pride to talk about um, LGBT history in various points of Chester's history. Um, so there are groups that need, so there are one or two groups that are like expanding their work that way, and it's really good to offer your expertise to them to so expand their like basis of what they're doing, or they already do some idiots and work. Then there's obviously the Young Archaeologist Club, who do some good work. But again, that's something you need membership of, you need awareness of it, and I think it's quite difficult for people who aren't involved in archaeology, don't have relatives involved in archaeology, to sort of find <coughs> these people, get in touch with them. It's all about boosting their um, appearance, really, and I think it would do worse then for archaeology and like sort of related humanities subjects um, to do something like the STEM ambassadors. Now STEM ambassadors are people who are involved in science, technology, engineering, and maths and it's sort of volunteer basis and um, you give your time up and go into schools and events and say you know this is what I've done as a career, it's something that you could do, here's some examples of my work or here's an experiment that you can do and repeat it. Uh, it's actually, there's like tens of thousands of these, it's, it's worldwide. Um, and I think that it would be really good for humanities to be able to do something like that as well, because they're, they're like purely science, so you can't go along and say, hey, you can't really go along and say, here's my dig idea, and this is my theoretical thing that I've built around it. It'd be great to have a version of the humanities that goes into the more of the theoretical side of things and says, well, here's what we can reconstruct from this evidence that we found, and how give you my facts, what, what can you reconstruct from it? Something a bit um, our side of things, basically. Um, so very briefly, because I've got my one minute sign, in summary, um, it's our field, we need to communicate what we do here. 
You know, we can't just uh, put out a pre press release and let the press run with it and do random and weird things like they tend to do. I know Sue's going to talk about Tin Chadwell later, where the press went mental and it's King Arthur, it's King Arthur, it's his palace and everything like that. You know, we're the best communicators and guardians of, of the knowledge that we're doing. And if we want it to get out there in a form that, you know, allows people to look at it um, clearly and allows them to see, you know, a good interpretation of it, we need to be the one who are communicating it. Um, and it's not just because we want the next generation of archaeologists. I know we're going to run against this shortage in HS2. We've got an ageing sort of like professional term. Um, but we also need a supportive public. And it's making our work relevant and engaging to them that makes them supportive, gets our image out there to public eye, makes them supportive of spending money on it, basically. Um, yeah, we need evidence-based, robust, engaging interpretation so that quacks can't use it, basically, and put their own impacts on it. And there we go. And that's it. Thank <laughs> you.